Eventually, I saw the river village on stilts through the trees, and we were received into the hut of the headman, which was hung all about with monkey bones. Chains of endangered monkey skulls hung from the roof. At the opening ceremony, the chief asked me for my straw hat, which of course I gave him, much to the delight of the native girls who said that I'd thereby married him. Keep the hat. <laughs> anyway, the pigs had eaten my bikini, which I'd left to dry on a convenient bone. But it was the trip back that was the real challenge. As we crashed through the waves in the dead of night, the shaft pin fell out of the engine, and Mummy had to hold it together with her Swiss army knife, like Hans the little Dutch boy plugging up the dike. Mummy, listen, I'm afraid we're going to die here in this Indonesian ocean, and just in case we do, I, I, there's something I want to clear up. Oh, don't be such a scary cat. Nothing's going to happen to us here. But, Mummy, just in case it does, um, did I ever do anything to upset you? I mean, I, I, I feel like you didn't love me or something. Did I upset you? Darling, I don't see I could be upset. I was never there. <laughs> Mummy, I, I thought you didn't love me. Really? How odd. I thought you didn't love me. But, Mummy, of course I loved you. I was just a kid. I thought you didn't want to have me around. Don't speak to your mother this way. This is ridiculous. <sighs> Mamie, why didn't you stand next to me at the funeral? It wasn't my place. The thing I was most afraid of was that either Mamie or I would do something so awful, Mummy would fire Mamie, like riding lessons. Every Thursday, Mamie poured me into my jodhpurs and my tweed jacket and my velvet hard hat and sent me down to Captain Gaylord's. But Captain Gaylord always put me on these huge horses instead of little ponies, and invariably they ran away with me. I would clutch the slight postage stamp of an English saddle with my hands thrust under the slight wave of a pummel. I would flatten myself against the horse's neck to avoid being brushed off by passing branches. I would see the land flying by miles below. I would be afraid of staying on. I was afraid of falling off. And then I would feel myself start to slip, and I knew I'd have to let go, and I would crash as I hit the ground, and the shock of pain as I felt the air knocked out of me. I would hear the horse's hoofs thundering away. Have I broken anything? I am safe. Then I would look up, and there would be Captain Gaylord in his German army uniform on his huge stallion. Oh, don't get back on the horse. Show him who's boss. <laughs> Mamie called Mummy. Oh, Mrs. Dejord, I'm so sorry to bother you. It's about Beau's riding lessons. I think it would be a good idea if she gave them up. She's not doing terribly well, and I'm afraid she may get injured. Mamie handed me the phone. Darling, don't be such a scaredy cat. Everybody has to learn to ride. If Miss Evans goes on spoiling you this way, we'll have to let her go. I went back to the terrace of Captain Gaylord's. Anyway, Mamie wasn't fired. I was the one sent away to Foxcroft boarding school. Mamie took me down to the station to catch the train. All the other girls' mothers were seeing them off, and all the mothers seemed to know each other. Mamie and I stood off to one side. Darling, you'll have a lovely time at Foxcroft, and forget your old nanny. All the other 14-year-olds had on kilts and cashmere sweaters. I had on a tight-fitted black and white tweed suit with high-heeled pumps I'd bought especially for the trip. I'd had my hair done in a very short gamine style I thought was terribly chic. That was the last chance I had for any individuality. <laughs> the next day, I found myself in the tan and green Confederate uniform of Foxcroft School complete with knee socks and oxfords and a hairnet under my confederate cap. Miss Charlotte had started the school in the 20s as a military academy
for the daughters of some of the most powerful and privileged people in the world. Her passion was fox hunting, which she did, side saddle, and the whole school rode to hounds on weekends. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we marched up and down the drill field with heavy guns that didn't shoot, called pieces. We memorized long, complicated manuals of arms to perform for the four-star generals Miss Charlotte invited down to review her private army. We lived in barrack-style rooms, four girls to a room, four closets, four bureaus. We slept on long, open sleeping porches to the wind and snow, we were only allowed in our rooms to change our clothes. Our closets had a certain order. The green jackets were next to the khaki skirts, which were next to the white shirts, which were next to the khaki shirts. And on the floor, the riding boots had to be to the left of the sneakers, but to the right of the oxfords. One thing out of order, one demerit. And on our bureaus, if there was one hair in the hairbrush, one demerit. And in the drawers, the green knee socks had to be to the left of the tan knee socks. And the bras and the slips and the panties were all lined up in designated order. Even in the bathroom, if there was one bit of chrome not polished, or the toothpaste wasn't in the glass, one demerit. Five demerits, and you lost the only privilege you had all term, to go out once for lunch every three months. <laughs> Big inspections were on the weekends by the teachers. Mm. The daily inspections were in study hall by the seniors. We stood with our arms behind our backs while they looked us up and down. They would kick a dusty shoe. They would punch a bulging pocket. They would yank a truant collar. And if it was a button loose, they would pull it off. There was nowhere to go to escape. It was like prison. We all did everything together. I had no idea how to relate to all these girls all the time. After dinner at a card table for two, <coughs> breakfast, lunch, and supper at a table for ten was a nightmare. Paralyzed by the need to relate to them all, I fled to my desk in study hall, where I propped up the lid of my desk as a barrier between me and the rest of the world and I sunk into its familiar interior where I kept letters for Nanny and stale peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> All afternoon, while everybody else was out riding and playing basketball, I propped a book up in front of me and read and reread the same page, Omnia Gallia Estabiza in Partes Trace. I just couldn't seem to take it. Omnia Gallia Estavisa in Partes Trace. I scratched my head and I scratched my head until I dug a hole in my head. And then the nurses put gentian violet on it and it turned my fingers purple and then it left stains on my pages. It was, I just went crazy. Once a month, we were allowed to make a telephone call. And I would take the telephone into the dormitory hall closet where I would huddle between the, beneath the rubber mats and the raincoats and I would be among the galoshes and I would call Mamie. Hello, Mamie. Are you there? How's Tinny? Oh, I just gave Tinny a bath. He misses you. I miss you so much. Only 73 more days until Christmas. I'll call you next month. The only place that was anywhere near as private as the galoshes closet were the toilet stalls in the bathrooms in the big school building. I would go into these gray metal cubicles and I would shut the door and I would take the saltines that I had been hoarding out of my pocket and I would eat them while I flushed like mad so that nobody would suspect. <laughs> Other girls had love letters, but I had saltines. Of course, I was getting fatter and fatter, but I wasn't the only one. My best friend, Lucy, and I were on diets. Did you see how much toast Claire ate for breakfast? She's getting fatter and fatter. I only ate the bacon and the fried apples. <laughs> oh, well, she said that she only ate one slice of toast, half with jam and half with butter. But I've never seen a human being put so much jam on a piece of toast. You know, B got a shoebox of chocolate chip cookies yesterday, and I had five, but I only had two sandwiches for tea. Oh, you're not fat anyway. Oh, Bruce, I am. Now,
never mind, I'm going to lend you my diet pill prescription on your next privilege. We have three whole months to diet. Oh, Brucie, you're the best. Brucie had real faith in me, so she let me cut her hair. I put a bowl on top. It just wasn't quite short enough, and, and then it wasn't quite even enough. And, well, then she had a crew cut, but she didn't care, and she shaved off one eyebrow to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> My art teacher, Monsieur Regal Buter, wore a beret and had a mad gleam in his eye. I just loved it when he leaned over my shoulder and said, that dog has real presence. <laughs> That's Timmy. <laughs> I had a horse voice for some time, but now I lost it completely. So they sent me to the infirmary where I had to hunch over a vat of steaming milk with a towel over my head. The fumes were supposed to heal my vocal cords, but nothing could heal me because I didn't want to be healed. I wanted to stay in the infirmary where I had a room of my own. And the head nurse reminded me of Mamie. When I got my voice back, I went into the closet to call Mamie. Hello, Mamie. Are you there? How's Timmy? Oh, we just had lamb chops for dinner. How's school? Will I join the KKK? <laughs> no, that's the name for the club for the children of alumni. Well, it was the only club I could join. I couldn't get the choir or the glee club. And to wear black silk shirts and black tasseled Mussolini hats of the WAP club, you had to be a horsewoman. Needless to say, I wasn't basketball material. But they named me head of the supply closet. <laughs> and this gave me a new oasis in which to eat saltines and peanut butter sandwiches. I didn't even go to meals anymore. I just hid beneath the boxes of notebooks and erasers in blissful solitude. Of course, the teachers found out, because I didn't sit at their tables in the dining room. And they sent me to Miss Charlotte. Bo, from now on, the entire school will march to meals to ensure this never happens again. To be sure, we march to meals. Miss Sharp liked to remind us of her power, even when she wasn't on the drill field. So at basketball games, she would say, who is the boss here? And we would say, you are the boss. You are the boss, you are the governor general, but no hobo, no hobo. You are the boss, and your name is Charlotte Hexel Noland. Then she would sing, I am the boss, I am the boss, I am the governor general, but no hobo. I went to the closet. <laughs> Hello, Mamie. Are you there? How's Timmy? Mamie, are you there? How's Timmy? Mrs. Lachand has given him away. That night I couldn't sleep, so I went into the bathroom at midnight. There was my roommate, Ronnie, with a razor blade. I asked her what she was doing. She said she was going to kill herself. Don't do that. I'm miserable here, too. I absolutely hate it. We've only got 1,088 more days till we get out. I lasted the 1,088 days, but my grades were so bad I didn't get into Radcliffe where all my best friends were going. I didn't really care because I thought college would be just like Foxcroft and nobody told me any differently. Anyway, I thought I was stupid and I think that the teachers and mummy thought so too. Mummy said, darling, I didn't go to college. You don't need to go to college. 